Yeah, very much. So we're working on it. I work in a materials engineering department. The project is called Specific. And really, the, the two images here, we're looking at maybe more applied research rather than fundamental. So this is Dr. Professor David Worsley holding typical laboratory. This is a disensitized solar cell. But actually, I work on nanoscale materials, but we employ everyone right up to architects. So these buildings have been built on our campus. So what we want to try and do is go all the way from a very, very small cell right up to photovoltaics on buildings. So we come from a very, very applied end of the spectrum. So today, I don't know how familiar everyone is with XPS. I'm assuming you're all technical, so I can maybe skip very quickly through the introduction. Um, and then the second part really is where I get excited. Um, so there's a lot of XPS spectroscopy, but the engineering around the instruments has improved considerably over the last few years. So looking at larger areas and things like this. And then this is uh, funded by the Welsh Government and the Quebec Government. So I will mention a little bit about Wales because it's a cultural project as well. So I will mention it just a little bit. Um, but first, just, just for, for, for me, how familiar is everyone with, with XPS? Very, very, okay, okay. I, I'm, assuming, I'm going to skip very quickly over the first slides because this will be really patronizing. So this is an XPS, but we can, we can skip through this uh, if everyone is familiar. Um, but what I would say for people, I, I haven't seen the XPS system here. The modern XPS systems really, really changed, and this will become apparent later on. Um, so I think if there's three things that I want to highlight about modern systems, firstly, it's the fact we can do very, very big samples, you know, three by seven centimeters. Some XPS systems will, will be even larger. Um, the charge neutralization is, it, I, I, I studied my PhD 20 years ago on an instrument that was 20 years old. So like charge neutralization, Whoa, this was, this was crazy. And my first job then was working in a steel company. So metals, who cares about charging, it's, it's okay. Um, so this was a real change. So this is very typical, this sort of sample. This is a microscope slide mounted directly into the XPS um, when we were, doing, we were doing copper work. So we wanted to have very good controls. And the other thing that's really amazing, and I really didn't appreciate how good it is, is the quality of etching guns in XPS spectroscopy has really changed what you can do in terms of depth profiles. Um, I'll skip over some of these. These are just to have a nice range of things. And uh, maybe we'll start here. Okay, so again, this is this is the background. This is when we say what we want to make as a solar cell. This is this is the objective. So this is me in my younger years when I was working in industry. Um, how do we do XPS? So this is one example. I just want to show, I'll be looking a lot of perovskite materials, but just to show a slight range of materials here. So this is a platinum catalyst on a disensitized solar cell. So the substrate, is, the electrode is uh, graphene based. Um, you can see here, I don't know, I, people do graphene work here, I understand. Yeah, yeah. I, my advice is don't do this for looking at graphene. My advice would be do Raman and do the, um, the D parameter in XPS. So there is an XPS measurement you can get that's qualitative, but you see this a lot. And, you know, I, I would not use this model nowadays. Uh, identifying SP2 versus SP3 carbon by XPS is actually really difficult. Um, but it's a good example of some of the some of the benefits you can get from XPS. We were looking at decorating this with platinum. Here we go. The platinum is present. Um, but what didn't get published was maybe some of the information, the useful information that you can get. So XPS can see oxidation states, things like this. So in this particular case, we had to optimize the amount of platinum metal that was present. So this, this process is one that was described to me as facile or facile. So it's an extremely difficult process, very expensive, hard to reproduce. Uh, but in the end, we did get there. Um, now, this is from yesterday. I was speaking to some of the researchers in the university. They are looking at plasma treatments of styrene. So this is published relatively recently. This is a PhD student who's now a doctor. So um, plasma treatment of uh, polystyrene, basically. This is what we were discussing in the lab. So hopefully some of them are on Zoom because I said I would include this. Um, so this is packing materials used for meat packing, very common in supermarkets. Uh, the problem is 
the, the juices come out of the meat and it's, it's very unattractive. And they make all sorts of changes and additions to this packaging that makes it extremely difficult to recycle. Um, so this, this student, Alain, did some really good work here. So this is the old type of packaging here. You can see this fabric. Um, and then this is this, this red dots. This is actually water. So what they've done in this manufacturing process is they've modified the polystyrene with the plasma treatment. And then they use that control of the wettability and the topography uh, in order to make this a much, much simpler product to recycle. In terms of the chemistry, okay. And again, hopefully they're on, they're on the Zoom call. It's really, really easy when you're looking at plasma treatments. You can see here, Alan was treating for 27 seconds. And already you can see significant amounts of oxygen on the surface. You can see the nitrogen as well. And also you can see that the, the carbon species with oxygen grow considerably. Um, and here it is in spectra. So there's your polystyrene. It's a very simple spectrum, more or less just a single peak. Um, tiny amount of oxygen. This is a real world sample. So there is always some contamination. Um, and here you go after plasma treatment. So this is yeah, very simple. Um, moving slightly more onto the solar materials now. Um, and again, I just want to emphasize how, how really good the depth profiling is. So this, this material was used extremely widely. Is anyone OPV materials here, organic photovoltaics? No, okay. In which case, this is a really cool molecule. Um, I love the fullery, um, but this, this was a really, really important molecule for a long time, PCBM. And it was assumed to be stable. Um, so what we did is we put it in sunlight over a period of time and then used depth profiling to examine the chemistry, the oxidation chemistry of this material. Um, so this is surface chemistry at the moment. Over time, this material oxidizes. Okay, uh, this is very, very bad news because this component was assumed to be stable in the solar cell. And obviously if you put it in light and it degrades, this, this is a big, big problem. So you can see here just the nitrogen, oxygen chemistry. Um, what, what I think is really cool, and this is using the argon cluster source on the XPS. So this is uh, the initial material. Um, for those of you who are less familiar, what would happen with traditional etching is you would fire the argon onto the surface, particularly for organic materials, and it would gradually start to turn the material more graphite-like. So it was extremely difficult to get chemistry as a function of depth. Um, now, maybe the styrene itself, okay, sorry, the PCBM, the styrene itself, it's okay. The substrate is an uh, ITO, it's an oxide, so you can see this is the substrate. However, after you have exposed it to light, you can see not only is the extreme surface oxidized, but this oxygen actually goes deep into the bulk. Um, this was very bad news for this particular material, but in terms of the XPS analysis, um, this, this sort of analysis is really, I, I, I love it. I think it's really exciting um, because normally this oxygen would just be gone. Um, and this is similar data. So this is just the amount of oxygen as a function of the etch depth. And you can see that the films, they, they were variable things, but around about hundred nanometers. So you can see there's oxygen present really quite deep into the films. Um, and yeah, there's a spectra at every point, but I can skip over that. Now, just to emphasize, this was a very, very important organic photovoltaic material at the time. Really every, every single photovoltaic cell with organics had this. This has moved on a little bit, but the principles of depth profiling are the same. So we've looked at blended organic materials like this. Okay, so this is a little bit more focused on the, the scale I'm working now. So as I've said, this is Henry Snaith in Oxford helped us a lot with the initial manufacture for the perovskite cells. So this is typical laboratory cells. So three by three millimeters by three millimeters active area. So really, really tiny. Um, what we then have is we have a a clean room where we can use various different uh, printing technologies to get up to uh, you know, a few centimeters squared. We have a roll to roll capability that is 10 centimeters wide and continuous coating. Um, we can then move it onto even larger systems. So we have a roll to roll system in another clean room, 30 centimeters wide. And we can also print up to one meter square on say a glass substrate. 
And then ultimately, this is what we're aiming for, is can we tie in with uh, partners? So this is actually, these guys work for Tata Steel and a partner, a partner company. So they're putting them onto rooms in the real world. Um, in terms of the substrates we use, we partner with many different companies for materials. We, we work with um, Nippon Sheet Glass. Um, we also work with uh, Tata Steel. So there's a big steel works in South Wales. South Wales is famous for coal, so it's a very, very industrial area. So it has a huge history of metal work. Swansea is famous for copper manufacture. And also ITOPET is very commonly used substrate for photovoltaics. Um, I, it's not an ideal substrate though, it's, it's expensive, it's very expensive. So one objective long term is to try and move away from materials like these. Um, so just briefly, this is a brief example on glass. Um, we work very closely with this company, Pilkington, they're part of NSG. And uh, there's a gentleman called Ben Smith, he did a, a really interesting piece of work. So. Um, Tech 15 is a 15 ohm square indium tin oxide film, and this is this is widely used for, for laboratory scale. But it turns out that Sir uh, Pilkington have a product, commercial product. It's used for used for greenhouses, conservatories, things like this. So really, it's in mass production called um, where is it? Eclipse Advantage. So what, what Ben realized was that the structure of Eclipse Advantage is actually extremely similar to the tech glass. Um, so he has constructed solar cells. So we used uh, this XPS, it's fairly simple, but we used XPS just to confirm that this M-type layer is present. Um, he also, we also used the XPS imaging just to confirm scribing. So he has to make scribes for the solar cells. Um, and it works really well. Um, so it's comparable, if you look, the efficiency is down here. So this Eclipse Advantage is comparable with Tech 15. Bear in mind, Tech 15 is sold as an electronics product and Eclipse Advantage is sold for keeping rooms warm. It was a really exciting find and Tech 7 is, is better. It is a better resistance, but that's okay. So, but more on to, to, to what we, we do now. So. This work's really recently been published by Dave Bynum and Ursha Parpatsian, who are some of my colleagues. In essence, the key bit is, is this. They've gone through every single layer and roll-to-roll uh, -roll printed it via slot dye techniques. So again, if you're familiar with the literature, lots and lots of people are trying to use reviewer, slot dye, screen printing, all sorts of technologies. Um, it, very few have done multiple layers. Some have done multiple layers, but very few have done all of them. Um, and the why, I'm not going to go hugely into it, into the, the, the perovskites, but really this curve, this curve here is the research efficiency of perovskite solar cells versus comparable silicon. So what you see with these perovskites is in terms of the efficiency of the cells, they're coming right up on laboratory scale. These efficiencies are coming right up, but it has a number of advantages. Um, it's really a low temperature process. You're talking 150 degrees, something like this to make a solar cell. Um, it's solution-based, so you can make it, any, anyone can make these materials. They're quite simple to make. Um, the solvents, are they're not so great, so they, they tend to be toxic solvents, but still, um, it's nice and easy to make, very cheap. And obviously, yeah, this is this is very high efficiency. Um, also, it's so these are some of the roll-to-roll -roll coating techniques in use. Um, we have chosen slot dye, so I'm not a printing expert, but the guys selected this through various selection process. We have access to a very wide range of technologies. Um, essentially because we wanted it to be roll to roll we want it to be a continuous coating process and it's really good at patterning, patterning and it tolerates a wide range of embryology we haven't got much flexibility although it, it is solution there isn't so much flexibility you're limited on the number of solvents that you can use um oh, there we go and then this is a, a schematic of the overall process so they initially coat in this particular case, they coat in oxide. On this is all done on this system, reel to reel. Then they've got the perovskite material, so it's methyl ammonium lead iodide. So this is really the classic traditional perovskite material. Um, then they use a P dot layer in this case. 
uh, and they don't want to add a carbon electrode on top of that. So it's not using silver electrodes or anything like this. Um, what I'd like to focus on right now is some of the work we did optimizing this particular layer. So this is the, the P dot coating. So just to simplify what we're seeing, we've got a, a general substrate stack. We've got the methyl ammonium lead iodide perovskite. And then on top of this, we have P dot PSS. Um, Oh, there is the perovskite structure. So just, just to emphasize, this is a classic methyl ammonium lead iodide perovskite. The other thing is, I don't know if I mentioned it, but you, I guess you're all familiar with this, sampling depth for XPS approximately 10 nanometers. So we have a relatively thick, in this case, um, P dot PSS film. It's tens, tens of nanometers thick to 100 nanometers. So just to emphasize, we should not be seeing any lead or iodine in this system. Um, and also, just so you're familiar, I'll talk about sulfur chemistry. This is P dot PSS, extremely widely used in organic electronics. Um, although there may, this is a commercial system, so there may be other species present, but yeah. Um, there we go. So job number one, they wanted to just check that the P dot was present. Okay, this is, this is relatively simple for XPS. It's helpful that you can also see differentiation between the sulfur and the P dots and the sulfur in the polystyrene sulfonate. Um, this ratio can be changed. There are many post-treatments that are done to change that, so we can quantify these ratios. Um, but maybe the surprising part when we looked at this is overall data. So what we have is the line trial material versus various target coating thicknesses of spin coating. Um, we see an awful lot of um, well, an awful lot. It's relatively low in some cases, but really we shouldn't be seeing any iodine or lead on these layers. These are very, very thick layers. Um, you know, I'm, well, there we go. Just to prove it, there we are. So there's some iodine, sorry, some iodine. There is some lead. Okay, we shouldn't be seeing these layers. This is potentially a problem. Unfortunately, with one spectrum, it, it maybe doesn't tell us so much. Okay, we know that we can see this layer, but it doesn't tell us if it's a pinhole, a spy, or, 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 or any one of a number of other things, maybe even just very, very thin coating. It's possible that there's just two or three nanometers of PDOT on top. Um, and indeed, when we do some cross sections of these materials, what one of the downsides of printing is on the scale of nanometers, these can be quite rough. So we can see here the perovskite film, and on top of it, this is the P dot PSS. So we can see actually there's a lot of scope for, for problems with this P dot PSS layer. Um, but what we did is we took XPS spectra over a large area of this plastic. So this is 28 millimeters by 28 millimeters. And what we are looking at is the amount of lead that we can see as a function, as a spatial function. So this is XPS data now. Um, so you can see, um, first we have very difficult pictures. I think I have to do really well. So the spin coated samples, you tend to have less in the middle and problems around the outside. And then the roll to roll materials, the images are, of course, the, the process defects are related to the processing. So the processing in this direction, what they found was you actually get vibration of the materials. And this is how you can see these vibrations here as a function of time. Um, the nitrogen, and just a brief aside for perovskites. Um, again, if you're really into your XPS, I love the, uh, there are different types of perovskite materials. So we are primarily dealing with methyl ammonium lead iodide. Um, so the nitrogen position here, but there's a very, very common type of material now called uh, triple cation. So it uses various components, but one of them is this material, formidinium iodide. And it's just really interesting to see that the charge localization looks really different between methyl amine and the form of the formate formidine system. Similarly, on the carbon as well. I mean, as a chemist, I don't instinctively look at this sort of structure. I, I instinctively think of this sort of structure, but actually it looks like it's more like this. Anyway, that's a slight aside. Um, and you can see then, we start to look at the, the chemistry over a big area. Um, it is a solar cell, so just, just to confirm that in the end, they did in fact make really quite efficient solar cells. 
all of this is is fully roll to roll versus uh, gold gold electrodes. Gold electrodes are not very commonly used because when you're making a gold electrode this big, it's not it's not a good, good way of doing it. And here they are. So this is the, these are the two guys who from whoops. These are the two guys who primarily did the work. So this is Urshad and Dave here, and a typical print run here. The other thing is with scale up, each experiment is very, very costly in terms of time. And you know, this this is there's several experiments on here, but really you're talking maybe a dozen experiments versus in a lab, you could do loads and loads of them. Um, gonna look at a slightly different architecture now. So this is uh, by a guy called Rahul Patidar, who's just successfully defended his PhD thesis. And this is in preparation for a publication. But again, it's slot dice and the technology is the same. But what he's doing is he's, he's got a very, very different architecture. Um, so we're gonna be looking again, primarily at this bottom stack here. Um, so we're gonna be looking at P.PSS, again, similar, similar conductor material. Uh, PTAA, um, very thin layer is introduced it has a slightly better band alignment is the theory with the materials. Um, but one of the problems he was finding was he was seeing a relatively rough substrate. Um, so you can see the room being squared here, so it's not very clear. And uh, you're talking, you know, four, five, six nanometers. Again, he's hoping to coat something like sub 10 nanometer layer of PTAA. So on that scale, the roughness could be very, very important. Um, what we did again was exactly this. So we looked at as a function spatially. This again is all XPS measurements. So spectra at every single one of these points. Um, in fact, I'll flip onto the next slide. But again, just to give you an idea of the scale. So we're talking this is 12 millimeters. The whole thing's about 20 millimeters wide. And the coating direction. Is that it? Yeah, the coating direction is up and down. And what you can get then is you can get some incredibly uh, information dense materials here. So again, this is looking through on the top layer. We're looking just through a layer of P dot PSS. So just like just like this. And again, it's not ideal, but at least on his initial work, we could see through this supposedly, you know, ninety odd nanometers, supposedly very thick P dot PSS layer to the underlying in indium in this case, although the sulfur itself looks pretty consistent. This is. This sort of material here is PTAA. So again, you can see we're using the nitrogen as a signature here for the PTAA. So in this case, okay, you know, the, the indium may be a bit better, but again, we're still seeing through the indium. We can also see the nitrogen. And then on the bottom layer, they combine the two. In, in this case, finally, we're actually starting to see that the indium is, is fully covered by these overlayers of uh, p dots and PTAA. Uh, it's not zero. There are still some coating defects here. You can see that these, these very, very low le levels of indium correspond to a defect in the sulfur map as well. But what's interesting about this, so, you know, at every single point, we've got a full set of spectra. So you can actually then correlate as a function of the different, as a, a function of chemistry. So here, for instance, we're looking at the amount of indium you can see as a function of the amount of nitrogen across the entire surface, so across that entire sort of 20, 20 by 20 nanometer area, 20 by 20 millimeter area. And I mean, you can see very strongly the correlation between the nitrogen and the indium. This is a very, very thin layer. If you don't put it down well enough or you have any defects, you start to see exposed indium. Um, less so to the sulfur. I mean, we're definitely seeing defects but it doesn't seem to correlate particularly strongly with, with the, the sulfur, unfortunately. Um, what I did throw in, so just a little bit of UVS. So we, there were several reasons for introducing this. The main, the main reason we've introduced it is to act as a bit of a bridge between the methyl ammonium iodide and this P dot PSS. Um, it also has effects on the layer, on the layers, so from a printing point of view, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, and then what you can see is the combination of these layers ultimately does give a higher efficiency, which was which was the goal than either of the layers on their own. And then, oh yeah, this was primarily by this gentleman who's just defended his thesis, so it should become, he's writing the paper now, so it should be out relatively soon, and Chris Griffiths did a lot of work on this as well. And then 
this is just a relatively brief area now, just talking about where we're coming from. So this is this is where I'm based. This is Swansea in South Wales. So Wales is in the United Kingdom, for those of you not familiar. Um, just a little bit of cultural. People don't realize that there is a Welsh language. Um, so Cymru is the country and Cymraeg is the, uh, the language. I guess very similar to Quebec, you, you, you have a language which maybe feels a bit under threat from, from my, my, my language, English. So Welsh is very, very strong in the, the north and the west. So my, 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 the head of the department and my boss, Professor Watson, they both speak Welsh at home, but it's maybe a minority language and it's really, really different from, from Latin or German. It's, it's, it's extremely different. Uh, and it has one of the best flags in the world, for sure. It's a really good flag. Um, the other thing I was exploring and I found by the Metro Snowden. So <laughs> there is, believe it or not, there is actually a railway station near, near the top of this mountain, but this is Snowden in, in Wales. So like this is, this was a big surprise. And the, people were saying, oh, why did you get off in Snowden? It's not such a great area, but it looks great. Um, so this is this is Snowden here, but there really, really there is, there is a railway at the top of this mountain, it's frozen. Uh, and this is the Welsh name. I'm going to maybe pronounce this badly, but uh, so it's really, really different language. Um, and also there are the, the, the most big cultural connection at the moment is, I don't know, do any of you watch this program about Wrexham Football Club? There's this Canadian actor, uh, what's his name? Ron Reynolds. Ron Reynolds, yeah. Oh, it's crazy in Wales. So he bought this small town football club. <laughs> And uh, it, it's really crazy. So that every time, you know, like, like a small town, really, really small town. Uh, and so he's coming all the time with people from Hollywood. Uh, it's, it's crazy. Um, but maybe like this is, our, this is our health system. You know, it's not quite, this was the BBC. This is the BBC headline page maybe two or three days ago. Like really priorities, guys. I know it's exciting, but like this is our hospitals. Anyway, that's different. And the other thing, another thing, Wales, if you do want to get a bit of Wales, if you go onto your Spotify and look at something like Welsh male voice choir, this is a very, very typical, the Welsh, really, that when they sing in church, it's a really, really amazing sound. And this is a Swansea, this is a Swansea based choir. And rugby, I don't know if any of you like rugby, but the Welsh really love, really love rugby. And then finally, this is, this is the campus that we work on here. Um, so this is our building. So the XPS, SEMs, TEMs are all in here. This is, actually, this is, this is one of the buildings that we constructed here. So solar panels. What we've also done is we have electrical and electronic engineers. So now we have people monitoring. They monitor not only the solar panels here, plus the energy usage here, but they actually monitor every single building individually. So what we're trying to build up on a scale of the campus is trying to understand exactly how much power is used in each building, when it's used, how it's used. And we're also adding, they're, they're retrofitting solar panels to all of these buildings as well. So we want to study really how the energy is generated, the quality of the batteries, and then how it's used in sort of all of these buildings. So for instance, there is now a new building here and they can see the power change across the whole campus just from putting a new building in. And then, yeah, please do visit Wales, uh, Swansea. So this is this is near the city centre here. And then this is really out west. It's a spectacular beach for Ross City. So, and that was all. And just to say thank you and mercy, and in Welsh, uh, um, to the Welsh government and to the Quebec government. And Jacopo, who's uh, he's really driven the exchange here. And then this is the professor, and I, I'm primarily an analyst, so a lot of people help me to generate materials. So really, all of these people have helped to generate materials that have gone into the presentation. So thank you to them, and obviously the sponsors. So thank you for your thank you for your time. And I guess are there any questions or any areas you want to see again, or or a broad? I'm happy for a broader discussion. So the so the question was for the SEM picture, how do you how do you get this cross section? Um, there's several several ways you can do it. Uh, one is you can literally be brutal. You can you could break the cell, and sometimes you get lucky. 
more systematically, there we have a focused ion beam SEM system. So this um, essentially you can use an ion beam to gradually etch into the sample. It's very slow, um, but it does give you beautiful cross sections. Um, there's maybe an intermediate step. We have a, a system that can. Uh, it's more, more like a more like a plasma system, so it, but it can etch in a very controlled manner. Um, but at the ideal case, we would use the focused ion beam SEM. But it, it will take maybe it takes a period of hours to generate something like this. But you do get beautiful, really beautiful in flat surfaces that you can then analyze. The question was how high is Snowden mounted? Um, it's not very high. I mean, it's yeah, that's, I don't know the heights, but it, it's probably not even called a mountain in, in, in Canada. You'd probably say, oh, it's a big hill. Um, it's, it's the tallest mountain in Wales. So, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Um, the, my question is, yeah. you presented the platinum on carbon. Yes. Uh, you mentioned it's uh, about hard to process how to make this uh, catalyst. And uh, how do you do it? So again, this is this is quite old now, but it, it was this was thermally treating hexachloroplatinic acid. Thermally treated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. So I, I, I had a, I, I've had a scientist very confidently tell me about that time. No, it's really easy. It's consistent. We used to do it. I used to make a lot of um, this platinization for dye sensitized. It's very important for dye sensitized solar cells. Um, and so you you're looking for an uniform coating. Ideally, yeah. Ah. And it's it's really very chaotic this coating. It's very very sensitive to the processing conditions. Now maybe it's it's a few years ago. Maybe they've moved on a little bit. But uh, you know, compared to sputtering or something like this. Yeah. So the question is, um, I've shown a lot of maps for the XPS. Is it is it time consuming? Is the question. Yes, yes, it is time consuming. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, so first, the, the two things. So I would allow maybe overnight. So, you know, a spectrum you can collect in, I don't know, high resolution data, 15 or 20 minutes, maybe, uh -huh. if assuming good signal. Still 20 minutes. Um, no, for this, you're probably talking, I will change the optimization. So I'll widen the pass energy, for instance, so I get more signal. Um, you do a lot of tricks. You lose, so you lose some resolution for sure, uh, because it's prohibitively long. So that, that most of these images are in the region of 16 hours to collect, so overnight. So somewhere between eight to 16 hours, depending on what you want to do. So, okay, if I was looking at say the perovskite layer and I'm looking at lead and iodine, signals are huge, so much faster. But for looking at really low levels, and that was the problem, seeing low levels of a lead, low levels of iodine, it, you have to spend time. But for each point, what's the area of analysis? It's about, it's, a, it's an oval, so it's 300 by 700 microns. Approximately, it, it, it fades away, so yeah. Um, so there's, there's two modes of mapping. So I'm doing large area, mostly large area rastered mapping. Um, you can also do what they call parallel imaging, or not like Kratos, and I think Thermo systems would do it as well which is much more focused on very small areas. So that would be 200 to 800 microns. And that's more, it's, it's in some respects more complicated because it, at least in this case, when you raster, okay, it's, it's time, but it's a spectrum at each point. Whereas when you're doing the imaging kind of focus, when you're doing smaller imaging, you tend to focus on one energy or build up a series of maps and then post-process that data. Any last question? Um, yeah. You presented these um, photovoltaic cells to you know, process large scale, but uh, it's all mixed with uh, heavy metals and toxic compounds. And uh, yeah. what's your take on this? Yeah, it's not it's not ideal. So um, we have had some success in so the solvents that, that they're the bits from processing that worry me because um, they they are almost it's so it's polar non-protic solvents. So almost every single one of them is toxic in some way. The only one um, that is, so it's, I don't know, depending on how, if you're chemists, DMF, things like this, they're really good. They go straight through the skin, um, often carcinogenic. They can take things through your skin as well. 
Um, so we have had some success there. There's a lot of work going on to change those. Yeah, I mean, lead itself, it rings a lot of alarm bells. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, firstly, they make good solar cells. And secondly, there is lead in, in, in pretty much every solar cell. You know, there's a lot of lead in soldering, things like that. So, again, people are looking at this. There's a, there's a large body of research looking at can you substitute tin, for instance, into the perovskite structure? Um, can you change the organics to allow different um, substitutions of metals? So far, really, the lead looks like it's very, very important. Unfortunately, you can take a percentage of the lead away, but I mean, it's still lead. You haven't changed the fundamental problem. So it is a problem, and there's a lot of people. Again, we have people working on life cycle analysis. So when the solar cell is end of life, what do you do? Can you get this lead out? Because in theory, you can dissolve it back out again because it's solution processable. But you know that's 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 a long way in the future still. Um, but they are very easy to make. That, that's the attraction. They're very easy to make, and they really are efficient. So, yeah. Merci. Okay. So yeah. So there, there were two questions. The first question was: um, We're using plastic substrates. Do do they degrade? Can they degrade? I mean, the answer there is yes. Yes, they can. And there again, there's work going on about how to keep those intact for as long as possible. So there's various UV blocking layers that you can, you can put on top of those. I mean, we, we also work with glass um, and glass has a big advantage, a massive, massive advantage there in that it's, it's very, very stable. So yeah, it's a problem. And it is one that the, that the, uh, the community they're very aware of, yeah. And then the second question that I've forgotten, <laughs> Tandem cells, yes, you absolutely can. Um, so um, I didn't include that, but um, they are being made on top of silicon solar cells as well. And what you can do with perovskites is because you have your lead center, but you have a choice of halogens then, we, you can mix the halogens up to take the, uh, the adsorb, well, make it more orange essentially. So you've got a lot of control about the wavelengths that they'll absorb in. Um, so you can then, tune that to some degree to so although it's less efficient as a single as a single layer it tunes better with the uh the absorption wavelengths of the silicon cell that's underneath so yeah there's a lot of work going on in various manners well i don't see why not i mean if you can yeah why not yeah i mean yeah yeah you'd have to think about how but but in theory yeah because it's it, it yeah, there could be solvent problems, all sorts of problems. But yeah, in theory, yeah, I don't know if anyone has done it on plastics, but there's really no no technical reason why you couldn't try it. Yeah. So the question is, have we looked at depth profiling of the perovskite? Um, yes, um, but for me personally, the 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 depth profiling isn't magic. So one of the one of the problems we have is that the perovskite itself is very fragile. So whilst the cluster sources are really, really good on um, organic materials, they're fantastic. The perovskite itself has a tendency to turn towards lead metal. So you straight away, you start to lose some of the chemical information. So we haven't gone down it very hard because yeah, even with the cluster gun, unfortunately. Yeah. And in, in fact, you have to be very careful about how you do the XPS of the, 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 the methyl ammonium type uh, perovskites, you can literally get it when you're firing x-rays at it, you can induce formation of metals just by changing the experimental conditions in the spectrometer if you're not careful. So it, in the end, we said, okay, we've got these other areas we need to look at. Rather than doing qualitative profiles of the lead layer, we went for quantitative data in areas that will help us. Um, we get a lot of questions about things like chlorine. That was that was a very common question. Yeah, yeah. We have we have so in some of the papers we have seen chlorine. So in, there's, for those unfamiliar, there's right at the beginning there was a big debate about whether or not you should include chlorine to help the processing of these sort of MAPI methyl ammonium lead iodide layers. And there was definitely some evidence it helped, but the chlorine always disappeared whenever anyone tried to analyze it. The chlorine was gone. Um, so one of one of the references there actually we, we monitored the chlorine and we could re reproducibly see that disappear as a function of processing. Mm -hmm. So it is possible to see it and it 
but yeah exactly what it does I, I i never got to the bottom of that and and nowadays we, we don't use chlorinated systems so we've moved away from that and the literature is increasingly moving towards these triple cation materials they, they seem a lot more stable yeah thank you